Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice, my lovely wife, and I, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our study of Paul's second letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, mm -hmm. um, this is our 13th part of that particular study. And I just do want to make a note of saying, you know, you should, it, it really is good if you have a pencil and paper or something, you can jot down notes. So if, you, if something comes to your mind, if you have a comment, a question, or a suggestion, drop us a, a line by email mm -hmm. at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. All right? All right. All righty then. Okay, last week we were talking about uh, the deceit, the, the, those things in the third chapter, the perilous last days and the things, the attributes the things that we will see in people during those perilous last days. So we're going to continue on in that. We had just started that last week. But before we do that, Alice is going to ask for God's blessing on our time together. Father, we just bless you, we praise you, and we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be able to study your word, to get into your word. And Lord, we thank you for the understanding that you've been revealing to us. And Father, we ask that you would just bless those yes. who are hearing the word, don't let us speak anything that isn't from you. Amen. And we just ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, as I said, we're continuing on in the, Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3. And we're still in, we're in verse 2, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about the, um, the, the things that happen for the people that, you know, the description that it gives of the, in its parents. Her, the perilous last days, the lovers of self, the yes, lovers of money, yes, the lovers yes. of yes. Is that a character or is that attitude of these people? Well, it's dealing with their attitudes and their behavior. Okay. And, and actually, that's kind of an important thing because we will get into and look at very soon here the, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the most powerful teaching that the world has ever seen. And what's typically called the uh, Beatitudes, mm -hmm. that's basically what it is. This is Jesus saying, okay, here are the attitudes that you're supposed to have. Here is the behavior that you're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. Because he was training them in righteousness to go out into the world as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. He right. was training them in righteousness, right? You don't have a behavior unless you have an attitude. I mean, exactly. you know, whatever you do starts in your mind, okay? Right. So, okay, so last week we started, I ended in the last part of our study talking about pride, being men being lovers of self. And being a lover of self, which tells you that you deserve it, whatever it happens to be, right? When it comes to the world and the things of the world, mm -hmm. that will lead you or lead a person into the very next item, which is being a lover of money. Right. And you'll love money because, first of all, you deserve it. I mean, that's the attitude that you have. Mm -hmm. And because you have that attitude, your behavior will reflect it, okay? You'll do everything. Money will, will drive you is what will happen, right? And that... That's your master. That lover of being a lover of money, the next one on the list of our hit parade of evilness um, goes right together with pride. The two are inseparably linked together. Now, I, I said when we started this program a long, long time ago in search of Christianity mm -hmm. that the most radical, the single most important sermon or teaching that the world has ever seen was the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, right? Most definitely. Is. That, and it is indeed radical. Mm -hmm. You see, Jesus had gathered his disciples. Now, this is... This is the beginning of his earthly ministry. Yes, he had gathered his disciples. His first right? teaching, was it? And this is the beginning of his earthly ministry. And what he is doing is he ins he's instructing them on the attitude and the behavior that they are to have, that, that is expected of them, mm -hmm. that is commanded of them, all right, mm -hmm. of those who would follow him. And as, as I mentioned, as Paul wrote to Timothy a little later on in his third letter, you know, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable. And the one thing that it says at the end of that is it's profitable for training in righteousness. So that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was training his disciples in righteousness. And as I said, before he would send them out as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. You have to be equipped. If God calls you to do something, he's going to equip you to do something. And the Sermon on the Mount was him equipping those disciples to do what he had called them to do. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, people... 
they'd not heard these things before, wow, or they hadn't understood them. <clears throat> not from their religious teachers, the Pharisees, and the, the, they, they weren't hearing these things. So Jesus would say over and over, well, you have heard it said, but I say to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because they hadn't heard it. And what he said to them, and what he is saying to us, was totally radical. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You don't have to kill somebody to be guilty of murder. Anger will do the trick, right? Yes, you don't have to lay with another woman to commit adultery. Lust has already done the act. You have to pray for your enemies. If you don't forgive others, the Father will not forgive you. That's radical. That's demanding. And then his, continue, his teaching continues on to say, no one, and Aaron's on the Mount, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Wealth. Mm -hmm. right? Matthew 6, 24. So when we're talking about being a lover of money, when we're talking about riches, you need to understand, and this is where we're going, that there is a division between serving God and serving mammon. And by the way, one of the root problems here is people always think that money will serve them. Yep. But what Jesus, the truth, mm -hmm. said was that you will either serve him or you will serve the money. Okay? Right. You'll be a slave to it. Now, remember, remember let me just go back to, to start with this, or better yet, let's look at, again at how Jesus started that teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. because order is important. The first thing he says is, blessed are the poor in spirit. So much of the Sermon on the Mount is focused on the, on the part that money or wealth plays in the life of believers. There's a lot in there in the Sermon on the Mount. Absolutely. When you give to the poor, don't let people see it. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. If men do see what you're doing, make certain that they glorify your Father in heaven, not you. Isn't that, is that not radical? Mm -hmm. I think it's radical. For this reason I say to you, take no thought for your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Matthew 6.25. This is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I, I've known women, and men don't escape this, by the way. I've seen women in the church mm -hmm. who will go out and spend as much for shoes or a handbag or a dress, enough that would feed okay. an African village yeah, that right. we've been to for a month. I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, yes. okay? I mean, we've been places like that. The poverty, I mean, we have traveled. We've lived in Central America. We have traveled through West Africa, East Africa. The poverty, I mean, most, most people in the Western world have no concept of the poverty that exists out there. And, but before you say anything here, let me bring to mind an Old Testament teaching on money. Okay. Okay. Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, yes. When I say Sodom, if you're like most Christians, you probably think immediately of the rampant and aggressive homosexuality that Scripture speaks of concerning the city, the city that the Lord utterly destroyed. And indeed, it was sinful. But it was the love of, was it, was it the love of men for men that was the root? No. No. Because listen to this, Scripture interprets Scripture. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. Ezekiel 16, 49. That was the sin. That was it. With all of its riches, Sodom spent their abundance on careless ease. Careless, think of the word careless, right? It's because they could care less about others. Their abundance, their wealth, was directed by the love of self. The Lord gives something to all believers, and he gives an abundance. And if he has given a person abundance of money, and it's not always abundance of money by any means, right? He will direct at that. And this is what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need 
so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. If he gives you abundance, it's so that you can meet the need of others. Quite unlike Sodom. Mm -hmm. Lovers of self and lovers of money. Jesus called us to take our minds off money and worldly things. Okay? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your fa heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 32 and 33, right there in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was teaching us how to be poor in the things of the world and how to be rich in the currency of the kingdom, which is faith. Think about that. Because Jesus said, so none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Luke 14, 33. Did he say all? All. He said all. And by the way, that I... That translates the same in any language. Well, it translates the same in any language, except it doesn't translate the same exactly in every Bible, exactly. unfortunately. Well, yeah. Because I have looked at virtually every English Bible, mm -hmm. and virtually every English Bible, with one exception, mm -hmm. says either all or everything, meaning the same thing. Mm -hmm. But the message, and I'll put quotes around it, the message Bible says you have to give up what's dearest to you. Mm -mm. That's not the same. Not at all. you got to give up everything. Everything. It's not like, okay, I'll, I'll pick this and I'll pick... No. You've got... Jesus said nobody can be his disciple unless you give up all. Okay? Beware the message thingy. You know, it, listening to the, this, and I've heard this so many times, the Sermon on the Mount to me now, doesn't sound radical. It sounds right. Well, it is right. <laughs> it, no, it is. But it does. I mean, it's so logical when when you study the word and how it interprets scripture, interprets scripture. But by the way, it makes yeah. it so right. Let me just say this. I, I think you know. If I, hear, if I say the word radical, I don't know what comes to your mind. You know, is it a terrorist or something? But the word radical comes from the same Latin word as the word radish. Right. To the Radical point. means getting back to the root. And the Sermon on the Mount is the root of our faith. Absolutely. So, you know, it's it's not, it's not, I was going to say it's not about being a fanatic. It's about it being a fanatic, yes. yeah. <laughs> because you're totally, totally engrossed in the Lord and the things right. of the Lord. Okay? So, yeah, be careful of your translations. You know, Jeremiah warned, be, beware the lying pen of the scribes. Yes. Right? It, it says everything. Okay. Now I'm ready to start. I'm sorry. Well, there's a paradox here. Yeah. You understand paradox. You know, in order to gain your life, you have to lose your life. It's mm -hmm. like seeming contradiction. Right. I, I mentioned in our last study, our dear brother now going to be with the Lord, going to his reward, hallelujah, Arthur Burt, had written a, a really great little book called How to Be Ordinary. And as he said in the beginning of that book, who wants to be ordinary? <laughs> I mean, this is not a title to, to make a bestseller. Yeah. Okay? It's our human nature to want to be extraordinary. It's our human nature to want to stand out from the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, if you're thinking about wanting to stand out from the crowd, just remember what Paul wrote to the Colossians. Okay, we, are, we have died and our lives are hidden with Christ in, in God. We should be hidden. We shouldn't stand out because that makes you a target. So anyhow, if I'm going to teach from Jesus' message on how to be poor, I doubt that that would become a bestseller either. <laughs> but it should, because he started the Sermon on the Mount by teaching, blessed are the poor. A lover of money will always be poor in spirit. Yes, yes. But a lover of money, in, you know, then we're supposed to be. No, no we're not, we're not supposed, supposed to be. To be. No, we're, no. We are, we are supposed to be poor in spirit. But we're, we're poor in spirit. The righteous, poor in spirit, will always be rich. Absolutely. Okay? Because we don't own anything. Because that's the paradox. If, you're, if money is what drives you, you'll never have enough. Mm -hmm. If money is what drives you, you'll, you'll never, it'll never satisfy you. It'll never fulfill. But we, when we are seeking, what did, what did I say? Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. All what things? Everything that you need. Food, clothing, that's what it says. 
So you're going to be rich if you're poor in spirit because the Word of God says, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. That's like, uh, you know, if I don't have any money in my pocket, but I got a billion and a half dollars in the bank, am I poor because I don't have it in my pocket? No, because I have access to it. Well, you have access to everything that you need because God has it and will supply your needs. The Lord calls us to give all in order that we might gain all. Mm -hmm. That's a simple truth. If you understand and believe the word of God, Paul, the apostle knew that truth. He wrote this, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. It all depends on what you choose to value. Amen. Do you value God or do you value gold? God. <laughs> well, you know, I'm substituting the word gold for, for money. But which, which is more important to you? Really, be honest with yourself. Just let a man examine himself. Examine yourself and see what's going on. You know, in Job, Job chapter 22, I'm going to read verses 23 to 26. If you return to the Almighty, you'll be restored. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. And ultimately, like, like David wrote in Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you I desire nothing on earth. In these perilous last days that Paul is writing about, remember that, is a, that, that these perilous days are about demonic activity. It's demonic rage. It is. It's demonic rage. And Satan wants you to love yourself rather than to love God. Satan comes, as Jesus said, well, he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10, 10. Satan comes to take away your life. Jesus comes to give your life and give it to you abundantly. Satan is a liar by nature and the father of lies. Satan des desired to destroy Jesus when he tempted him in the wilderness. Isn't that true? Yes, absolutely. And it says in Matthew 4, 8 through 10, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, that was prosperity preaching for sure. That may have been the very first, first really prosperity big message. prosperity message, right? Yep. But let's get back to God and mammon, right? Satan holds out the promise of abundant life through riches, while Jesus provides abundant life through faith. Okay? Jesus came to provide eternal life, and Satan comes to kill and take life through his lies, his constant practiced deceitfulness. In the parable of the sower and the seed, by the way, and Jesus said of that parable, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all of the parables? Mark 4.13, you better understand this parable. And it's written there, and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Matthew 13, 22. You know, there's an expression in the world that says, money talks. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. Yes. But you better understand that it lies. Big time. It lies, it, because it makes promises that it can't keep it is not your savior the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word mm -hmm. it'll kill you it'll strangle you it'll strangle the life of the one who has not learned about being poor in spirit and trusting in the provision of the lord we have to learn the secret that paul knew 
because he wrote and he said in, in Philippians 4, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you do not yet have the faith to trust in the Lord to meet all of your needs, then you will trust in money. You'll love money. Yeah, you'll have to trust some. Yeah, you, you gotta, yeah. It's you'll like some. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, but you're going to serve one. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money. You're going to serve mammon. You're going to serve riches, right? If you don't have the faith to trust the Lord to meet all of your needs, then you will trust in the money. You'll love the money. And you will serve money rather than God. So blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. mankind. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 And James, when I get a little stronger, James said, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4.4 4. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul writes a little bit later on in this third chapter of his letter that indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is one of the great promises of God. You like the promises of God? This is one of the promises. If we desire to live godly and we're in this world, we're going to get persecuted for it. 2 Timothy 3.12 You know, I was just thinking about the fact that the, the world is the enemy. It's, if you make you're, you're a friend yeah. of the world, you make God an enemy. Because it's in the power of the evil one, it says in First John right. five nineteen. And if people going back would say during the, the Hitler time of Hitler, I mean soldiers absolutely hated the enemy, and they wouldn't become friends with them at all, right? I mean no. it's the same type of thing. Why would you want to become a friend of somebody that wants to destroy and kill you? Well, you don't. You don't. And that's what the world wants well, to do. I mean, an easy way to put that is you've got to choose sides. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, there is no fence. Jesus Christ said you're either for me or you're against me. There is no middle ground. There is no fence to sit on. You're either for him or against him. I mean, let's, let's be clear. But And as Alice is just saying, and as I said, it says in 1 John 5, 19, this present world, the world system, is in the power of the evil one. Yes. And it's going to be until Jesus Christ comes back. I don't care who you vote into office or what your politics are. Satan is going to be in control of this world system until like, Jesus comes riding in on that white horse. Um, in, if in, our, if our, in our days, in our times, the time comes that John wrote of while he was on the island of Patmos, right? That no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name, that's what it says in Revelation 13, 17. What will you do? What will you do if you can't go down to the grocery store and buy your necessary food? Take the mark? You have to. Excuse me. Alice doesn't no, mean... Doesn't no, mean, I don't mean you don't... If you're in the world, you have to. If you're in the world, yes, you have to. But we, we can't. No. We, we, we are not allowed to. We are. Right. The problem is we are able. Because you have to make a decision. It's a choice. Are you? It's, choice. A, it's always a choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always been a choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. I mean, are you going to are you going to choose God in the face of that persecution? Are you going to take the mark, or are you going to trust the Lord, to whom nothing is impossible, and of whom King David said, "Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints, mm -hmm. for to those who fear Him there is no want." Young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Psalm 34, verses 9 and 10. Did God not supply when they were out in the wilderness and there was no food? He supplied everything. Did he not supply when they were out in the wilderness and there was no water? Yes. God will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But you have to choose. Mm -hmm. Are you going to look for the manna? Or are you going to look for mammon? Mm -hmm. Which is it going to be? The mammon or the manna? To turn mm. from trusting in money after having been so conditioned 
so trained all of our lives to do so, yep. it is a truly radical thing. Yes. I mean, you know, listen, we all grew up in this world and you are bombarded day after day after day with everything, with newspaper advertising, television advertising, radio advertising, billboards. You are always being bombarded with the power of mammon because that will get you these things, all right? So is it radical to change? No, it's a command to change. It is a command. It's a basic concept. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Right? And if, if it seems perhaps too radical to you, the things that I'm saying here, and believe me, you need to have conversations with the Lord. You want to hear radical, right? But then consider this statement of Jesus Christ. He said to his disciples, he said, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. John 16, 12. You have to be ready to bear these things. You have to be ready to walk in faith. You have to be ready, and Jesus said this, to count the price. But if the goal is eternal life, if you have been storing up your treasure in heaven, not in your local bank, or not in your piggy bank, or not in your mattress, if you have been storing up the things, your treasures in heaven, why, why are you afraid of going there? I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't count on having your gold when you get there, because God's used it for paving stones. That's how important, important it is, right? And you know what? The only way that you can do this and that you're capable of doing it, following these commands is by what Jesus said, you must be born again. Absolutely. Because I mean, if you're not born again, there's no way in the world you can do I, any of this. Yeah, well, we're doing these studies. I'm, I'm assuming, maybe I shouldn't be doing this assuming, that you have a relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And having gotten that, being born again, that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Well, that's where the power comes from now in your life to live this radical mm -hmm. life. That's right. So this is all about relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about righteousness and it's about relationship. I'll tell you what it's not about. It's not about religion. Not at all. It's not about relics. It's not about rituals. Mm -hmm. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he will care for you because he loves you. So we are the bride of Christ. He'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. And God the Father, he loved you so very much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die that horrible death on a cross to supply the one thing that you needed above all, the cleansing of the stain of sin in your life. He will, he'll meet every need that you have. Trust him. Believe in him. Count on him. Confess him in Jesus' name. Well, until next week, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you knowing that you're a loving Father. Lord, that you will indeed watch over your word to perform it. The things that you have promised us, you will deliver. That you will do, Lord. But help us by the strength of your spirit that indwells us to have those attitudes, the same mind in us that was in your son, Christ Jesus. Help us to walk, behaving like Jesus Christ. I just pray that, Father, in his precious name. Amen and amen. Well, until next week, when we will continue on in this third chapter of uh, Second Timothy, be back with us then. God bless you, God bless you and goodbye.